OK, hey, everyone. Welcome to the session. Um, this is one of our, oh, I'm supposed to press the button. I will press the button. Ta-da. All right, so this is Anatomy of a Great Extension. And this is one of the, or this is the first actual talk in the wave track uh, at I.O. And this talk is actually geared towards people that have actually already probably used the APIs and have made a gadget or a robot and are thinking about how to actually make their extensions better and more usable. Um, so hopefully, you know, that applies to you guys. So to start off with, uh, I want to remind everyone that we are using WAVE as a back channel for the conference. And since you guys are probably all fans of WAVE, this is you know, a great thing for you. So if you do have your laptop out and you do have wireless access, uh, you can go to bit.ly slash wavy dash x, and that'll take you to the live WAVE for this session. So that live wave has a place where you can ask questions. It has a place where uh, my colleague's going to be taking notes during the session. And uh, also, you know, obviously, it's a wave. You can have free form discussion on it. So feel free to join there. And uh, we'll add our resources to that wave after the talk, too, so you can uh, review the slides. All right, so first, talking a bit about me. So my name is Pamela Fox, and I work on developer relations for the wave API which basically means that I'm helping developers like you guys write very cool extensions. Now I want to know a little bit about you guys just to get a feel for what the audience is. So how many of you guys have uh, developed with the Wave APIs before? All right. How many of you guys have used a Wave extension before inside your Wave? OK, good. All right, so it sees about half of you guys have actually used the APIs. And most of you, or all of you, have used Wave extensions. So, uh, you know, some of the things uh, for people who haven't done the APIs, you know, may go a little bit over your heads, but I think that you'll still uh, get some insights from this. All right. So first, let's just review what Google Wave is. Right? It's basically this communication tool that combines a lot of nice features into one. One. Right? So we have stuff like, uh, you know, multiple people on a Wave. You can reply anywhere. You can reply inline. You can have nested replies. You can have live editing and real-time transmission of what's happening. And uh, you can have this rich media inside your wave, whether it's attachments or gadgets or stuff like that. So really, this product could be used for all, all kinds of things, right? It, you know, it could be email 2.0. It could be a wiki, whatever. But what it turns out being best for is, right now at least, is getting stuff done with groups of people, right? Basically, everyone who's really enjoying using Wave now is using it to do something project-oriented with some people. Now, Google Wave extensions um, are basically ways of extending this very generic communication tool into something customized for a particular use case, right? So for example, out of the box, uh, Google Wave may be very good for task tracking. But when you add in a task tracking robot that auto tags, auto assigns, creates saved searches, then it becomes like Google Wave becomes a killer app for task tracking, right? So the whole point of Wave extension is helping these users get stuff done faster and better by customizing this generic tool even further for them. Right? So as, well, as a developer making an extension, you should be thinking about you know, what is your, your, your extension is helping people do and making sure that it's highly usable. Right? So in this talk, we're basically talking about you know, how do you make these extensions that users are going to love and that are really going to take advantage of the power of Wave for working with groups of people. All right, and much of this advice is actually based on advice that I've given developers. So when you create an extension as a Wave developer and you want to share it in the gallery, you actually submit it using this in-Wave submission process. So you create a, a Wave with us and the review team where you answer a bunch of questions and uh, you, know, you link to a sample Wave. And then we basically we go back and forth. And you know, we say, like, well, uh, you know, the, the uh, getting started is a little bit hard, or the, the, the thumbnail just doesn't work for me, right? So we go back and forth, iterate, and then when we're all uh, satisfied, we approve the extension for the gallery. So every extension that you see in the gallery has gone through this process. So I've done about um, 80 of those extensions. You can see my save search for them there. And uh, in doing those 80 extensions, I've developed uh, quite a few opinions and uh, uh, ideas about what it is that actually makes a good extension. And I would venture to guess that I've probably tried more extensions than anyone in the world. <laughs> and you should see my toolbar. My editing toolbar takes the entire page up. Um, so I've tried a lot of extensions. So basically, today, it's all about sharing what I've learned with you guys. And 
you know, I'm and uh, hoping to hear what you guys think as well. All right, so I've broken this up into uh, different steps and kind of going sequentially through the process of using an extension. So the first thing that a user does when they're using an extension is that they see the installer. So the installer is how you, in, you actually insert an extension into your wave experience. So here's a wave with an installer. Installer is a very basic widget, okay? It has just a couple um, uh, parts of it, but all those parts are actually very important. Um, the first part is the name. Okay, so the name should be descriptive, and it should also ideally uh, be unique, and maybe also be a bit, a bit wavy, all right? So this here, this is an installer for a task tracking robot that I highly recommend, and it's called Tasky. So it's good because task indicates it's task tracking, right? Tasky uh, makes it more unique because it actually, you know, has a Y on the end. If you add a Y, something becomes more unique. And it also makes it wavy because if, you know, if you haven't noticed, we tend to end a lot of our robots with Y, and it's a little bit of a tradition that we intend to keep doing forever and ever and ever. Um, so it's a great name for this robot. Descriptive, unique, catchy. Then we have the description. The description says, use the new wave menu to create tasks or the toolbar to create tasks from selected tests. So this description is really great because it says uh, how we're actually going to be using the extension. We're going to be clicking new wave or we're going to be selecting text. And it says what happens when we do that. It actually creates new tasks. So I know what this thing's going to do for me and how I'm going to use it. So great description. And then we have the thumbnail or what I call like the iconography. And the thumbnail here is a very basic check mark with a simple color scheme. And this thumbnail is important for a couple reasons. One is that it's going to show up when they look at the extensions gallery. So when they're quickly looking through, they're going to be looking at all those images. And you know, people love to look at images. So the more descriptive and catchy you can make your images, the better, because they're going to be drawn to, that, uh, to your extension and be clicking on that instead of the other ones. Uh, the other thing that's important is because uh, this thumbnail is actually used in multiple places. Uh, when a user is using the extension. So you want to have it be recognizable and be the same everywhere. So for example, uh, this one, here I've created a new wave, a new task wave basically, and I can see the thumbnail is the robot avatar, right? So when I'm looking at the waves that I've created with Tasky, I immediately know that they're Tasky created because I see this thumbnail. So it's a nice visual recognition for me. Now when I want to select text and click a toolbar icon, the toolbar icon is once again that, uh, that uh, check mark, right? So this is good because now when I've seen the image in the, uh, in the installer, then it's the same image I see on the toolbar, it's the same image I see on the robot avatar. So you want to keep your images and your iconography the same throughout, and you want to make sure that iconography is descriptive and recognizable. All right, so now once they've installed your extension, they're actually going to see it, right? They're going to put it inside a wave and see what it looks like. And um, you have to decide what is your extension actually going to look like? What's the look and feel going to be, right? What's the interface? How is it going to be styled? So the way I see it, you basically have two options or two situations. The first situation is if you are creating an extension that integrates with an existing website that you have, right? And maybe that existing website already has users. People already know it. If you're doing that, then you should actually base look and feel on your website, right? Um, because users will see your extension, see the website, and they'll make the visual link and think, ah, this is just bringing that website into Wave. I understand that this is the same website. This example here, this is six rounds. Um, they're actually uh, at uh, I.O. in the Sandbox pod, if you want to go visit them. and. Uh, they're, they're an existing website for interactive video chatting. You know, they were around before Wave, and their look and feel is this orange, gray, black, bubbly, rounded corners thing, right? And uh, when they went to make a Wave extension, they brought that look and feel into the Wave extension as well. So when you look at it, it looks very distinctively like um, you're using the, the app of another company, and if you decided to become like a full-on six rounds user and using it outside of Wave, it would feel like a co uh, consistent experience. So as a company, that's probably fairly obvious for you to reuse your existing user interface. So then the question comes up, if you're not making an extension that's based on some existing website or company, then what should it look like? So some people use like jQuery UI. I mean, everyone uses jQuery UI. Some people use Gwit. Um, and some people don't do any styling at all. But what I would recommend is that you try to make 
your extension look like the wave interface, right? Because imagine that a user has like five different gadgets in a wave. Imagine each of those gadgets uses their own like arbitrary look and feel. Maybe they each use five different jQuery UI themes, right? It's just when, he, when you're looking at your wave, it's going to look kind of cluttered. It's going to feel a little awkward, maybe a little bit ugly, right? So if instead each of those gadgets all mirrored the wave user interface, then you look at your wave and it just it feels like this cohesive experience and you feel like those extensions were actually built to live inside wave and it's a happy habitat. Um, now the thing is that it wasn't easy to mimic the wave UI in the past because the wave UI, it's, uh, it's all created um, from GWT widgets, so it's Java to JavaScript and so if you wanted to pull them in you'd have to do some crazy copy and paste, which I did do, um, but it's not easy. So what we've done, and we launched this uh, today, is made a wave UI library. This is inside the gadgets API. You can check now the reference. It's, uh, it's live. And uh, it's, it's simple right now. It's got a couple methods in it. And they basically take elements and convert them into wavy looking elements. So we have wave.ui.make button, takes an anchor element, turns it into a button, even with little mouse down effects. Uh, wave.ui make dialog takes a div and turns it into um, you know, basically what you'd use instead of an alert. Please don't use alerts as a general rule. I mean, I do it too, but let's just all try not to use alerts when possible, okay? And uh, then we have wave.ui.makeFrame, which is a nice way to give a border to your gadget. I always recommend bordering your gadget so people know where a gadget ends and text begins, so that's a nice way to border your gadget. And then wave.ui.loadCSS, that's actually called by each of those, but you can also call it separately, and that just imports a style sheet that defines very basic uh, CSS rules like the, the body, uh, font family, font size. So it just takes on the, you know, the general look of the client. Um, so we just launched this. There may be a few issues with it. Please uh, you know, try it out, give your feedback, let us know what other elements you think you need, and you know, drop down, et cetera. Um, because I think it's really, it's gonna make extensions just look a lot better if they're all kind of sporting this cohesive uh, look and feel. All right, so now you've looked, at the, you've looked at the extension and you're like, oh, it's pretty, it looks like Wave, it looks like a company, whatever, right? Now you actually want to start using it. Now there's a, there's a lot of things that you can say about user experience, and there's actually a talk later at I.O. that you should go to that's entirely about user experience. Um, and, you know, it's always useful to, to learn more about that. Uh, what I often find myself telling developers is just to improve the user experience of the getting started experience. The first few minutes of using a gadget, those are really important, okay? Because you know, they, they try, they insert your gadget, they see it, if they can't get it working in two minutes, they're probably never gonna use it again, right? And as developers, I think we often forget about those few minutes because we know how to use a gadget, we're used to it, and we get, then, then you know, we get beyond this getting started and we get to the next stage and we're like, oh, it's so cool once you're in advanced mode, but if they never get to advanced mode, then you've lost them, right? So you should really focus on what that getting started experience is like if you wanna keep them users. So, Couple examples here. This one is your brainstormer. It's a great uh, brainstorming gadget created by a couple students in Singapore for a class assignment on Wave. And as soon as you insert this gadget, it pops up a dialog that prompts you to fill out the main topic, right? So when you're looking at this, the only thing that you can do here is fill out that main topic, which I think is cool because as a user, I don't have to think, right? I can just do the first thing that needs to be done, which is fill out that topic. So then when I do that, it shows me the main topic, food. I always think about food. And uh, then I'm looking at this blank space, this canvas, and thinking, okay, well, what do I do next? Well, what it does is that this gadget actually pops up this little call out up in the upper left there that says, click here to learn how to use this gadget, and points back to a how to use button. And it keeps that up for about 15 seconds and fades it out. So this is really cool because if I've never used this gadget before and I'm staring at this node in the middle and I'm not sure what to do next, I immediately see this little call out in the corner and think, yeah, I'm gonna click there. That's a good idea. So then when you click there, you get a very simple to understand help screen, which has a legend and has some keyboard and mouse shortcuts, right? And so I can look at this help screen then, do some stuff. If I forget some things, I can always click back on that how to use button, right? So I mean, the lessons you learn from this one is making the first step really easy whether it's setting a location or adding a person or whatever it is, and then always uh, making it easy to find the help screen, help button, and maybe pointing it, making it a little more clear um, to people that are using it for the first time. Now, another 
uh, intro experience that I really like is this is um, from CS Odessa Mindwave, and this is another set of developers that are at the sandbox um, and actually sitting in the audience as well. <laughs> and um, they basically, they've created this mind mapping gadget, and it's actually, it exports to their desktop software, which I think is really cool. Uh, and when I first tried to use their gadget, I, I couldn't really figure it out. I hadn't done much mind mapping. I'd never used their, I'd never used their thing before, and I was pre presented with this blank canvas, and I just didn't know what to do. I, I couldn't figure out the navigation. And I, I explained that to them, and I said, like, listen, I just really need a better getting started experience. So they came back with this, which is when you first insert the gadget, it actually creates a tutorial mind map, right? So this is just, this is actually the help in the form of a mind map. So what you do is you actually browse around this mind map to learn how to do stuff, and you can go and add some nodes to it, collapse nodes, expand nodes, et cetera. So I'm both reading the help and using this interface at the same time. So I think it's a really cool interface for learning how to use this, you know, this mind mapping thing. So this, I think, I mean, you're not going to be able to do this with all, all, all the things you're doing, but it's a, it's, you know, a really nice way of approaching the, the help screen getting started experience. So yeah, you can visit them in the sandbox later if you want to see more and actually play around with this uh, tutorial screen yourself. All right, so now we actually get to using the, the extension. So here is where I talk about waviness which is the characteristics of your extension that really make it fit inside the wave environment. And um, it's really different from being inside of any other environment, right? Stuff like ease of use and uh, look and feel, that's the kind of stuff you'd be thinking about you know, in, in, in any gadget container or robot container or whatever. But waviness is something only for wave. So let's talk about that. Uh, so first I'll talk about gadgets, because um, they have their own unique characteristics. And first, let me clarify you know, what it is that gadgets are and why it is that you use, use them. So this example wave here is completely text-based, right? Just using the textual editing functionality of wave that comes out of the box. All right, and it's a, if you can't tell, it's a zombie killing planning wave, which is a, a very common use case for wave, as it turns out. So what we have here is we have a list of addresses, which is where we're going to kill the zombies. We have the weather, so you know sometimes it's shitty, or, you know shitty weather when you're uh, killing zombies. And then we have the list of volunteers for the mission, right? So you know this is cool. You're looking at this wave. You're thinking, yeah, all right. I think I know what it is we're doing. I think I'm ready to kill some zombies. But what if you're looking at this wave? This is a wave that's used gadgets in order to visualize some of the information that we saw in the other one. So instead of that list of addresses, we have a map with polylines and polygons and markers on it, right? Uh, instead of the weather list listing, we have a visual image of that weather. Instead of that bulleted list of people, we have a yes, no, maybe gadget. So now when I look at this wave, I really start to understand it better, and I don't even have to parse that much information. So basically, the point of gadgets is to extend textual communication into visual communication where it makes more sense, right? Where it's just easier for the user to visualize that kind of information um, you know, with a gadget instead of as text. So because gadgets are basically you know, an extension of textual communication, gadgets should share all the same properties as textual communication. And uh, sharing those properties is what makes gadgets wavy. So I'll, I'll explain more on this to you know, make more sense. So for example, one property of textual communication in Wave is the fact that you have multiple users editing at once at the same time. So when you see this in text, what you see is uh, multiple users indicators, right? So we call them the user carrots, the, the colored little indicators with their names. So here I'm, we're writing the story, and I see that Vadim is up at the top, Austin's at the bottom, and this is in the middle. So it's really helpful when multiple people are editing at once to know where they are, because that way, you know, you only work on the parts that you need to. If Austin's working on the conclusion, then I'm not going to work on the conclusion because I hate conclusions. I'm happy to work on the middle, right? And it means that you know we work on different parts, and we can parallelize the work more um, because we can see where each other's are, and so we can get to the end point faster. So being able to visualize where other people are makes you more productive, right? Makes you get that stuff done faster. In gadgets, it's the same thing. If you have multiple people working on a gadget at the same time, you want to know where those people are and what it is that they're modifying in that gadget, so that you know that you're not replicating work and that you're going to get this done faster. So this example is Sudoku, you know, one of the first gadgets we launched. And uh, basically, the goal is to try and solve the Sudoku board, right? So figure out the numbers that go in each spot. 
So what it does is that it visualizes the colors of the cells as and relates them as a legend here to the actual people that, have, um, that are in those cells right now. So when I'm looking at this, I know that Dan is in that purple cell, so there's no reason for me to be in that purple cell because he'll probably figure it out first, right? So by knowing where other people are, we can actually solve this Sudoku bound faster. So generally, you should try to visualize where it is that everybody is inside your gadget. I mean, the, the visual space for everybody's gadgets is different, so it's not gonna all, always be like this straightforward grid. But if there are multiple people at once, try and show people where the other people are. And uh, if you are using something like colors, include a legend. Uh, otherwise, you can also use, a lot of people use thumbnails. People do tend to recognize photos quite easily, except when people use ridiculous avatars. <laughs> All right, so similar to that, when you have multiple people doing stuff in a wave, uh, wave actually points out or calls out the information about your state in a particular way. It renders your information differently, and I call this viewer-specific information. So one example is that when you're typing, uh, Vadim and Austin, they have these colored indicators. I just have a blinking cursor, right? So when you look at a wave and you're wondering, well, oh, where am I editing right now? You look for the blinking cursor, right? You don't look for your, your colored indicator. So this way, it's really easy for me to actually figure out where it is I am in the wave um, because it has a unique rendering versus visualizing where the other people are. So you want to do this in a gadget as well is to call out the information that's most important to the viewer, right? So this example here is a very simple gadget called Likey, which lets you like or dislike things, right? So I click like, and it you know, says the total count, and then it also says you like this on the bottom. So immediately when I look at this gadget, I don't have to sit there trying to figure out, you know, did I like it, did I dislike it? I see, oh, I like this. Um, so this is a simple example. If you're doing something like a game, you would call out the viewer's score in a different you know, visual than the rest of people's scores because you care more about your score than everybody else's. Um, so there's different ways that you can kind of separate or distinguish the viewer's information versus the other people, but you should try to do it because people are always the most concerned about their particular contribution to something. So emphasizing that is good. And you can do this in the Gadgets API pretty easily because you can get the current ID of the viewer and you should always be storing uh, participant IDs in your state when you're relating it to pieces of information, because then you can just compare, all right, there's a current viewer ID, and this bit of information in the gadget was contributed by this participant, so I'm gonna give it this special rendering. All right, now another aspect of text editing in WAVE is that there are two different modes of editing a WAVE, or a blip. One is edit, and one is view. And uh, these have basically you know, different ways of showing the interface. So edit mode, that's when I'm actually editing the text in a blip. And here I've got a blinking cursor, I have a done button, and I have a full on editing toolbar at the top to let me do stuff like bullets, insert gadgets, et cetera. Now if I look at the map gadget in edit mode, it's similar. It has a toolbar at the bottom for adding markers and lines and polygons. When I click on an info window, it uh, has text boxes so that I can actually enter in information and change it inside that info window. So it's fairly clear to me when I'm looking at the map gadget in edit mode that I am editing this information, right? I'm contributing to the state of the gadget. When you go into view mode when you're textual editing, your cursor changes, uh, you lose your blinking cursor, and that toolbar at the top goes to just doing these private read-only actions. So it's pretty clear that you are in read mode. And just on a note, because I did mention cursor, always pay attention to what your cursor is doing in a gadget. I think cursor changes are really important to users to indicating when stuff is clickable, uh, when stuff is mouse, you know, master overable, <laughs> stuff like that. So cursor changes are pretty important. Don't, don't, uh, don't treat your cursor lightly. So here's view mode for text editing. If I go into view mode on the map gadget, you can see I lose my editing toolbar at the bottom. I only have the zoom toolbar left. And when I click on an info window, we're simply seeing text nodes and not input nodes. Right, so it's pretty clear that I can't actually edit any of this information anymore. Now you don't have to obey the edit mode, view mode difference in your gadgets. You could technically have it so they can be editable in all modes, and that's kind of design decision you have to make. But there are many situations where it really makes sense to have a distinction between edit mode and view mode. We'll, we'll see one in a, in a demo coming up. And if you want to do that, it's really easy in the API, uh, gadgets API. You just set mode callback to a particular function, and whenever the mode changes between edit and view, because it can change multiple times, you can get the current mode, 
and you can switch your interface, call some functions depending on what the current mode is. All right, uh, so actually, on that note, I want to bring up uh, this team here to show off their gadget, uh, which shows off a lot of the wavy features that we were just talking about for, uh, for gadgets. Okay, thank you very much. My name is Michael Goderbauer. I'm from the processwave.org team, and today I'm here to introduce you to our processwave.org editor. And the processwave.org editor basically is a collaborative diagram tool for Google Wave. So that means it allows multiple persons to edit the same diagram at the same time. While I present this editor to you, I'll point out some of the wavy features Pamela was talking about earlier and show how we implemented those features into our gadget. So to get started, I have created a wave here. Right now it's still empty, so we should get started right away and insert our editor into this wave using the button up here in the toolbar. Uh, as you can see, we currently support six different diagram languages from the area of computer, of software modeling, as well as business process modeling. For example, there are UML class diagrams for the computer fellows, as well as event-driven process chains for the business department. But today, I feel like illustrating this very process of me presenting the gadget to you using the business process modeling notation. So that's why I pick BPMN up here. The editor will fire up. That'll just take a few seconds. And if we would have better internet connection, that would be a lot faster. <laughs> but okay. <laughs> there it is. Um, here, you can see our drawing canvas. And there's a shape repository on the far left side. So since each, each process starts with a unique starting event, I'll start our process here by dragging out a starting event onto the canvas. So there it is. Next, we need an activity. So activities in business process modeling notation are represented by those rectangular shapes, which you can see here. So I just take one and put it next to the starting event onto the canvas. The first activity of our process would be me entering the stage. So I just type enter stage. Next, we need to connect those two shapes to indicate the process flow. So I'll do that by using this little arrow down here. OK, at this point, I now realize that modeling all by myself here is kind of boring, and you don't really want to do that. But hey, this is a wave, and it has actually never been easier to invite all your friends to a crazy modeling session. And that's what I'm going to do right now here. So I'll add my friend Martin. He is in my contact list right here. Martin is sitting here in the audience, and we'll just have to wait a few seconds until the wave has loaded um, on his screen. Hope that doesn't take uh, too long here, given the internet connectivity here. Is, is it loading? <laughs> OK, we'll just have to wait a few more seconds, hopefully. Well, I can just use the time to add another activity here to our diagram using this um, shape menu as, as shortcut. So what would be the next thing? That would be me load the extension. Are you with me now? He's with me now. So Martin will now uh, do some contributions to this diagram. And we should see his changes to the diagram instantly on my screen, just like you would expect in a wave-like um, environment. So we hope, there they are. So he added another activity here. And you might also uh, notice that the shapes created by him cast a green shadow, while my shapes sh uh, cast a red shadow. So we actually use those different colored shadows to indicate um, which person touched a shape last. So the green shapes obviously were last touched by my friend Martin here, while I touched the red shapes. And in case you forgot um, which color belongs to whom, you can always refer to the editor tabs down here, which has a complete list of all colors and all contribu uh, contributors to the diagram. In addition to that, you can also hover above a shape, and you can learn more about its last edit. So this shape here, for example, was last touched by Martin Kreichgauer, and he moved the shape about, tw about 20 seconds ago. To give you even more information about the modeling process, we also implemented a little change lock down here, which basically lists all changes to the diagram in chronological order. So this can, for example, come in quite handy when you haven't opened a wave for quite some time, 
and you want to do some catch up on the recent changes to the wave. You can just open here that change log and read it. As a little bonus, we also implemented a little um, under redo functionality into this change log. So say that I don't like the contributions Martin has done to the diagram. I can just click here and they are all gone. But since I will say goodbye to you eventually, <laughs> I better redo that by clicking down here. And there they are again. So let's get our focus back onto the diagram. You might notice that there's something missing in between. There's, there's a step missing between loading the extension and saying goodbye. So we should better fix that. I now delete this error. And Martin is going to insert a split into the diagram. Now, a split in business process modeling notation means that two things are happening in parallel. And obviously, here, those two things would be me talking to you while I present the gadget on that screen here. So let me just add another activity down here, and bam. OK, just <laughs> when I added the shape down here, at about the same time, Martin also edited, uh, created a shape up here. And as you can see, those two concurrent edits coming from two different clients were merged into this beautiful, consistent diagram, just like you would expect in a wavy environment here. OK, now to finish the diagram, we would have to add some more errors, and we also would have to label those shapes. But since my professor of software, uh, of business process modeling is not present here today, I just skip that uh, step as I'd like to say a few more words about the user interface. When we created the processwave.org editor, we realized that it's actually kind of hard to create a good UI for an application inside of Google Wave. Because when you picture the wave, you have that navigation bar on the far left, then there's that huge inbox leaving you with only one third of the space for your gadget. So, you really have to come up with some slim UI uh, to make good use of that space. Because if, when you think about it, there is not really that much space. Well, you can see our solution here up on the screen. We have created that slim user interface, which only has um, a few interface control elements attached to the edges, leaving you with as much space as possible for the actual diagram. In addition to that, we also implemented a view-only mode um, Pamela was talking about earlier. So when I uh, finish uh, editing this uh, blip by pressing the Done button down there, um, all the user interface control elements disappear, leaving you with as much space as possible for the diagram. And I think it goes without saying, I cannot edit the diagram any longer when I'm in this mode. Well, that's pretty much all I have to say to you here today. I hope you like our editor. And if you do, I'd like to invite you to turn your browser to our website, process wave.org. There you'll find an installer for our gadget, and we'd uh, like to invite you to take it for a test run. We are also curious to know what you think about our gadgets, so if you have the time, you should stop by at our spot in the developer sandbox and talk to us in person. So thank you very much, and we are looking forward to seeing you there. I think that's really, really cool. I'm really impressed. So if you make extensions as cool as that, then you're doing great. All right, so that's an example of a, just a really, really nice uh, wavy gadget. It has a, a clear use case you're collaboratively modeling together, and it uses all these nice characteristics of wave. So now let's talk about robots, um, which is another you know, one of our big APIs. So uh, you know, the, let's look at uh, you know, what it is without, without robots, right? So normally, when you're waving, you're waving with normal humans, all right? So in this example wave here, I'm waving my friend Austin, I'm gonna ask him a bunch of questions. I'm like, okay, well, what is life? What is the meaning of life? So Austin responds really slowly. He takes about 30 minutes to respond, and he responds really just poorly, all right? He thinks the meaning of life is to drink beer when everyone knows it's 42. So um, the point of humans is that, you know, they're, they're great for, you know, conversations and opinions and all of that, um, but they're, they're, they're uh, you know, they're humans, so they're subject to faults, and they're also slow. So robots, are basically programmatic participants that can be smart because they can be accessing data stores and APIs and information systems you know, outside the wave, and they can be fast because they can respond as fast as a server can respond, right? So the point of robots is just to be uh, these basically you know, automated participants that can really streamline different aspects of communication and make it better. Uh, so in this example here, I'm actually asking a bot the same questions, and he responds within the minute, and he responds with, uh, you know, definitions actually pulled from a dictionary. So when you're creating a robot, 
your robot should have all the same characteristics of a human, just better, right? So we'll take a look at some of the characteristics of you know, the ideal uh, robot participants. So one of the things about Wave is the fact that people can respond to you in real time and people can type in real time. So when you're on a Wave with another person at the same time, you actually see them typing. And like, people really love that moment when they first see somebody else typing in a Wave at the same time. It's their little Wave aha moment. So real-time response is one of those great features of Wave. It just makes it feel more real. And also, when it comes to stuff like document writing, it helps you get stuff done faster, right? Because you don't have to wait for the other people to edit so you see them immediately. So when you're creating a robot, you should try and create robots that respond as quickly as possible, right? So ideally, robots respond as soon as they see something happens. So this example here, emoticon robot. I'm typing, and I type uh, you know, my sentence, and then I type a colon, and then I type a parentheses. And as soon as I type that parentheses, the robot detects that and turns that into a smiley face, right? So here, the robot is responding in real time, and I don't have to wait to see what's going to happen. I see immediately. So that's kind of a, you know, ideal when you're doing a robot like that. And uh, in the robot API, you can register for the document changed event, which is the most high frequency event, which occurs something like every four characters. Um, so you will get notified quite a lot of when stuff is happening in the wave. But you can now, with the new API, you can set filters to say, I care about document changed event, but only if, that, if the current blip text actually contains the information that I'm looking for, right? So here I set a filter for smiley face, because I only care about the event if there's a smiley face that I can convert. So depending on what your robot is doing, you should think about whether it is that you can actually respond as quickly as document change, and if you can optimize that by setting a filter. Um, so another thing about Wave is that you can be waving with multiple participants at the same time, right? I've seen Waves with up to 500 people on it, right? Actually, I had a wave uh, for one of these I.O. sessions, the Android, Beginner's Android wave. There are something like 700 participants on that wave and 400 blips, which is pretty ridiculous. But all these participants are on the wave together, and they're actually managing to have conversations with each other and uh, actually following an etiquette, right? They have these conversations in different places. So they're collaborating together on having uh, this conversation inside wave. So you should be able to collaborate with robots just as easily you can collaborate with humans. All right? You shouldn't have to worry about adding a robot to your wave because you're worried about what it's going to do to you. You should always expect that a robot is going to have the same kind of etiquette that a human would have. So there's never a fear of collaborating with robot and with a ro multiple robots. Um, so to explain this, I usually give an example of a non-collaborative robot, which is in incredibly it's just a, a very bad experience for people. So this was actually the first robot that I wrote. And it was called Cartoony. It's actually still alive if you want to use it. And Cartoony would take every single blip and turn it into a word, a cute word bubble that was colored um, using the Google Charts API. So I thought this was really cute, because suddenly all my waves were filled with these cute word bubbles. And you know, they just look so happy. Uh, but everybody else hated it, because as soon as you added Cartoony onto a wave, Cartoony would go through and basically take away all your content and replace it with all these silly images, right? So people could no longer go back and edit their text because it was gone. It was just an image. Uh, other robots couldn't operate on the text that was there because the text was gone. So it basically destroyed all the content and replaced it with something uh, that was not useful and wasn't what people wanted. So it was highly non-collaborative robot. And my colleague ended up writing a robot specifically designed to kill Cartoony. Uh, so if, if your robot is so bad that people create robots to counter that robot, that's a good sign that your robot is not collaborative. Or even if people ever say about your robot, no, 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 don't add this robot onto this wave, that means that your robot is potentially being non-collaborative, right? So you need to have your robot operate in a way that uh, people aren't afraid of adding it onto a wave. Here's an example of two highly collaborative robots. And these robots were both developed independently. Um, but they happen to work beautifully and synergistically together, in fact. And this example of where you know, robots together could really shine. So here we have Syntaxy and Monta Mont uh, Monty. So when you put Python code in a blip, Syntaxy sees that Python code, and it applies annotations to that text to make it look colored so that it's basically syntax highlighted. right? And then Monty comes along and looks at the actual text inside that blip and uh, basically evaluates that Python text and outputs the result, right? 
So you can basically have this syntax highlighted, evaluated Python code inside your wave. And these robots work beautifully together because they actually operate on different parts of the wave, and they basically miss each other. So they, they don't touch each other at all. Syntaxy sets annotations, which if you're not familiar with the wave model, annotations are separate from the text. So you can set annotations for style and for storing custom data, um, and that'll be stored separately from the text. Syntaxy only operates on the text and completely ignores the annotations. And so because they operate on these two different parts, um, they actually work really well together. So the lesson here is that you should think about what it is that you're operating on and uh, whether you could be using something like annotations um, better in order to not actually affect the, the content as much. Um, but it's kind of hard to define what it is that makes a collaborative robot. So I'll give a few more examples here of aspects of, of collaborative robots. So one thing is that uh, robots, like humans, you should be able to use human language or natural language to speak with them, right? When you're speaking with your colleagues, you don't use, well, you might use command lines because we're developers. But generally, you use natural language to speak with your colleagues, right? When you're speaking with a robot or interacting with a robot, you should be able to use the same thing. You should be able to use natural language. But for some reason, developers, I mean, I know why. Like, developers really like to have robots that respond to command line stuff. Um, because number one, we're used to it. We think the whole world is, you know, just this big um, VI shell. And number two, uh, it's a lot easier to parse, right? You simply look for that command and you execute it, all right? So this robot here, it looked for slash map and then an address. It would take that line and it would convert it into a map. So it worked, but it's, uh, it's bad for two reasons. One reason is that it's not collaborative, right? Talking about the collaborative nature. If you have two robots that operate on addresses and one robot says that the syntax is slash map and the other robot says that the syntax is pound map, then the user can't use both these robots as once because they expect different syntaxes or the user has to repeat their addresses with the two different command lines, right? So it's not collaborative if a user has to learn a different syntax for interacting with your robot because it means that that syntax is probably incompatible with all the other robots out there. And it's also just not user friendly because you don't want to have to memorize the syntaxes for all these different robots. So a better thing to do is to actually be able to respond to natural language. So this example here, this robot, Geobot, uh, when you create a wave that has place names in it, it actually analyzes the wave by sending it to the Yahoo Placemaker API, which then responds back with places that it's recognized and the ranges that it found those places in and also the latitude longitude for each place. And gets, it gets that back, and then it annotates each of the place names with a link to uh, Google Maps for that location. So this is great because it's simply operating on place names said the natural way, right? I didn't use any special syntax here. And uh, it's also sending an annotation on these, um, which means that other robots could come along, and the place name is still there. Other robots could also operate on these place names. So it's not easy to necessarily respond to natural language, right? I mean, there's massive research in natural language processing and all that. Um, but when you can do it, uh, you, you should really should. And, and there's APIs out there that would help you, right? There's the Yahoo Placemaker API. Um, there's a, a couple other semantic analysis APIs. There's a, a group of developers at the Developer Sandbox um, that have a robot, an Amazon robot, that actually analyzes your text to find possible product names and then links those off to Amazon, and they use this uh, named entity analysis technique. So it's not easy, but when you can, you should try to actually respond to this natural language. Uh, all right, so another way that a robot should be collaborative is by being non-destructive, and I've kind of hinted at this before, is that you know your users type stuff in a wave, you should do what you can to leave that content there and just add to it. It's always better to add to content because users can always take away stuff later. But if you take away content, then when they want to get that stuff back, they have to go back into restore or whatever. They have to go and find it somewhere. So when possible, try not to remove content. Try to append content, and then let the user decide what to do afterwards. And it's similar to when you're interacting with users, like or with other humans. You know, When we're editing a draft together, if, uh, if we're trying to figure out the title of a blog post, we'll often just put a list of different blog post titles and kind of decide from that list instead of actually you know, replacing one title one after another with our different ideas, right? Because if you're not 100% certain 
that a particular content is what you want, then you want to have all the possibilities and be able to kind of look at that. So here's an example of, um, of a robot that went from being destructive to actually uh, collaborative and impending. So this is Googly, and Googly is a URL shortening robot. So when Googly was first submitted to me uh, in the extensions gallery, what it would do is that it would look at a wave, it would find every single link in that wave, and then it would replace every single link with a, uh, with a shortened URL, right? So that wave would become this one, which has all these Google shortened URLs in it, right? So this is, this is bad for a couple reasons. One thing is that it's operated on every single link and not giving me an option which links I want to operate on. Usually I'd only want it to operate on a few. And it's also gotten rid of my original link title that I had there, so it's removed content that's going to be hard for me to get back. So when we revise Googly, the new interface is as follows. Basically, you have your wave with your links, you select the link you're interested in, you click the Googly icon on the toolbar, and then the Googly uh, robot sees what you've selected, and it responds by appending a Google URL after that, right? So this is good because now I can decide which link I want to be operated on, and I can decide whether I want to retain my original link or combine it with the new link or do whatever I want with the content, right? So it's giving me the option of what to operate on, and it's appending the new information instead of removing, right? So always try to give an option and always try to append instead of remove. And if you do want to respond to user selection, which I recommend for actually quite a few uh, robots these days, it's pretty easy to do it with the extension installers. You just have your menu hook for the toolbar, which says there's an icon on the toolbar. When that icon is clicked, you do annotate selection, which says that uh, the current user selection will get annotated with a particular key and value, and then your robot gets added onto the wave. And your robot will get an event, and it can look through the event in the wavelet to see where that annotation was applied, and then it can operate on the annotated text. And there's some examples of that in the article section if you want more information. But that user selection paradigm is actually a pretty useful one. All right, um, so that's robots generally. And robots are a little bit harder to describe what it is that makes them wavy. But I mean, generally, being collaborative, um, trying not to be destructive, trying to be as helpful as possible, giving users options, these are the things to think about. Now, I just want to touch briefly on a particular type of extension that could be a gadget, could be a robot, and could be a combination of a gadget and a robot, because there's some interesting characteristics of this. And that type is games, right? There's a lot of people that are excited about Wave as a gaming platform because, hey, it's really easy to add multiple people onto a game, right? I always used to make these silly little games in uh, you know, college and high school, and I always wanted to make them multiplayer, but I just couldn't be bothered to set up a multiplayer infrastructure, right? So Wave kind of has this nice thing, like multiplayer stuff already built in, and then it also has the surrounding um, interface which could let you do other stuff like combine conversation with games. So a couple games here, Shoots and Ladders, um, a great card thing, uh, J Japanese chess, and uh, Dungeon and Dragons, or you know, dice. So one thing that you want to think about is um, the fact that, let me just move this, the fact that in Wave, you can have multiple participants, right? You don't know how many participants are going to be on a wave. OK, it might be two. It might be 300, all right? Most likely, on an average wave, it's probably more like three or four, somewhere between you know, two and six. Um, but I see a lot of people who create these wave games, and they create them as two-player games, right? And two-player games are just, it's not a good experience inside wave, because if you're on a wave with a two-player game, and you're the third person on that wave, you're going to be really sad because you don't get to play this game, right? Because it's only been targeted towards being for two people. A better experience is if a game can actually accommodate more than two people, right? Multiple people, um, maybe infinite, maybe up to some reasonable amount, right? So Sudoku is an example that you know, supports quite a few people on it. And another example that I like is uh, poker. Um, which is a, a new extension that came out recently, which is a combination of a robot for the dealer and a gadget for the visual. And it supports between two and eight participants, which is pretty good, pretty good size. So if I've got the two people I can play, and I can go up to eight. So that's a nice experience, because I, you know, I can actually have those three people on it and still get to play. 
So I know that there's a lot of two-player games out there, so it's really tempting to port a two-player game over to Wave and you know, call it a day. But I like, encourage you to think about how you can actually turn those two-player games into something that can actually work with more than two players. Because then you can actually end up turning the game into something new entirely, right? So maybe instead of being two players, maybe you have two teams of players, right? So that you divvy up the different people on the wave into teams. Um, maybe, you know, I don't know, there's a lot of different things that you could do, but it can challenge you to actually rethink the game and maybe come up with some new games that we haven't seen before. So keep that in mind. Another thing to keep in mind is kind of the opposite of that, is the fact that on a wave, you can just have one person. I have lots of waves that only I'm on, right? I'm taking notes, I'm tracking some tasks by myself, writing my epic diary entries, whatever it is, right? So you can have waves with only single people. So ideally, your game could actually be played by just one person in a wave who's bored and wants to play, right? Because it's a bad experience if you can't. This example here, Mafia, which I think would be a great thing to do in wave, but when I insert it into a wave, it says, it needs four to eight players. And when I see this, I think, no, I can't find four to eight friends. That's, that's hard, I don't have that many friends. And then I kind of get sad because I don't get to play Mafia, right? Um, a better experience is something like this row of four robot. When I add row of four onto a wave, it checks to see if there's anybody else on the wave. And if there is, it lets me play row of four with them, also known as connect four. And uh, if there isn't, it lets me play against the robot. Right? So if I'm alone, I can always play against that robot. So that's the thing to keep in mind with Wave. You can always fake participants, because you've got robots, right? And uh, you know, it's a little bit harder, because you have to write some logic into the robots. This row of four robot was 23 lines of Python code, and it beats me every single time. My colleague wrote it, and he's really proud, and he's going to get a shirt that says, he beat me in 23 lines of Python code. Um, so for row of four, you know, maybe that's it's fairly easy to, to make that logic. But for other games, you may be able to do it as well. So consider using a robot for your alternate players. Another thing is you can do is simply, uh, you know, inside, this is Colcrop. What they do is actually let you play against the computer, and their computer is just a you know, JavaScript simulated player inside the gadget, which is you know, another example. Not maybe quite as wavy, but still an option. And the thing I like about this one is that it actually lets you pick between computer level one, two, three, and four. So this would be good for row four, where I clearly cannot compete against the current level of that robot. And uh, I can pick my lower level. Because that's the thing, right? When you're playing games with friends, you pick who you're playing with depending on whether you want to win that day or whether you actually want to challenge. So ideally, you can do the same thing with these uh, robot or computer participants inside games. All right. so. That's, um, those are kind of the, you know, the big picture of the, the stuff that you should be thinking about when you're making your extension and you're really polishing it and trying to make it ready for users. So we talked about the installer and having the an installer be descriptive and be recognizable. We talked about the look and feel, having it look like your company site or looking like the actual wave look and feel. Um, the ease of use, getting started, how easy it is in those first two minutes of using the gadget, and then the waviness, which is all these different factors um, you know, which are unique to the wave environment. So now for some next steps. Um, for you guys, you know, basically homework. The first thing to do is that I really encourage you to try other people's extensions, right? The reason that I have all these opinions and uh, you know, experiences with you know, good, bad, before, after is because I've tried so many different extensions and actually tried to use them in real life. Um, you know, try to use them with friends that aren't, you know, wave really wave users aren't technical. So try out different extensions and see what feels good to you. See what makes sense to you. See what you like, what you don't like, and uh, you know that'll help inform your decisions because you can think like, well, I remember in this gadget, I didn't really like when that happened. And so you can go through the extensions gallery. If you click on all, I think there's about 55 or 60 in there that you can play through. So that'll take you a fair amount of time. And then once you've actually tried those extensions and you've built your extension and you're ready to share it with the world, then you can submit it to our extension gallery and go through our extension review process. And, um, but hopefully, the fact that you guys are all here today will mean that the extension review process will only take like five seconds and then I can just immediately click approve and be good to go. But it's a really fun process because you get to actually talk about the design and you know, have um, discussions about what would be the, you know, the best interface for it. And also, as a next step, you should go to the other Wave Talks at Wave, all right? Um, because if you're interested in making extensions, 
then these talks are going to help you out a lot, right? So we have, uh, we've already done a fireside chat in this one today. At 3 p.m., we have Waving Across the Web, which is going to be talking about a couple of the new APIs that we uh, launched this morning, uh, Wave This, Wave Data APIs, and also talking about the Embed API, which we made some recent improvements to. Uh, so definitely check that out. 415, that's more about the protocol um, than, uh, than platform, but if you are interested in Wave Federation and having your own Wave server, you can go to that. I mean, the cool thing about Wave Federation is that federated servers can actually support gadgets and uh, hopefully you know, robots in the future too. So when you're building your extensions, you're not just building them for Google Wave, you're potentially building them for all the, the other uh, Wave servers out there. So there's already a few Wave servers that support uh, loading other people's gadgets in there. So that, that kind of multiplies the possibilities for the number of users and the types of users that are going to be using your extensions, right? Because our Google Wave may be consumer oriented now. Other people's Wave servers may be enterprise oriented. So it's a different uh, use case. Thursday, we have making smart and scalable Wave robots. Highly encourage you going to that one because that's really going to, um, most sophisticated extensions do involve a robot. And that's going to really give you some tips about making a good robot and also taking advantage of some of the new things we launched, including the ability to have robots not running on App Engine. So if you already have an existing server and infrastructure and you want to use that to use your robots, you should go to that talk to learn how. And just go to learn how to optimize uh, your robot usage and make them awesome. Google Wave in the Enterprise is going to talk about more of the business use cases of Wave and uh, also step through an example of an extension that uh, we would actually use inside our enterprise for uh, software development, so for release management. So that should be a good one. And then 445, it says surprise session, but we, uh, we announced it today, so it's no longer surprise. And that's going to be talking about the attachment APIs. So in Google Wave, you can attach uh, things to your Wave, like PDFs, images, et cetera. And uh, for a long time, robots could not access them. But now, as of today, they can. So you can do some pretty cool stuff, being able to access and create attachments. Because um, you can imagine like one person would drag a bunch of CSVs into their wave and then add on the CSV bot, and the CSV bot would come along and take all of that and then convert it into a map of addresses, right? Uh, or another example that they're, they're going to show is actually being able to convert a wave into uh, a PowerPoint, right? And then export it back into the wave. So really cool stuff that you can do with attachments. Um, so definitely go to that as well. So in conclusion, you should go to everything. You should learn everything. And you should build everything. OK? <laughs> and in conclusion, I have the cutest little goodbye. Cartoony. Thanks, guys. <laughs> so we have two minutes and 10 seconds, or seven minutes and 10 seconds for um, for minutes or questions, I can't read that far away. All right, so I'll go to the wave to see if we got any can questions. I, can, I, wave. can I ask a question? Yep. And it's yep. open question to you and to all to everybody here. The usability question. So, gadget we build is based um, nearly entirely on keyboard shortcuts, mm. and keyboard shortcuts will, will work when the iframes it hosts gadget is focused. So uh, now you should just double click gadget so it will be usable. Otherwise, you'll be hitting enter. It will start new blips instead of inserting topic to mind map or something. So what is the best way to indicate it? How do you think to, uh, to I indicate user that he's not activated gadget? Or, or uh, should it be visual representation? Should it be some guide? Should it, what, what, what will be the best decision? So you're wondering about how do you indicate to the users to yeah, use Or maybe keyboard using shortcut? keyboard shortcut is not a good practice at all. I mean, I, I'm not personally a keyboard shortcut user, mm. and I always forget about them. You know, Control C, Control V, of course, yeah. but then beyond that, uh, Control E, maybe. Um, but no, I think keyboard shortcuts they are a good thing. Um, but I think uh, you know what we've started doing in Wave is actually writing the keyboard shortcuts on the uh, yeah. on the the elements. So yeah. done here says Shift Enter. So yeah, you immediately that's... know. When you look at this, that the keyboard shortcut for mm -hmm. that is Shift Enter, mm -hmm. and um, we did that a couple other places as well because we we actually mm -hmm. analyzed. So one mm -hmm. thing you can do is actually analytics to figure out how many people yeah. are using your keyboard shortcuts yeah. and which ones are they not using, and that helped us figure out that we needed to message ours better. So I think using keyboard shortcuts uh, is a good thing. The specifics of using them inside gadgets I haven't run into too much, but mm -hmm. I think messaging it and 
giving them little hints is important. Okay. Oh, okay, thank you. Zero, seven seconds left. We have had spacebar forever, uh, but it was one of those keyboard shortcuts that once again was not, uh, not discovered by people. So now it, we added this little button at the bottom that says next on red, which is basically doing the same thing as, short, as uh, spacebar. And if you scroll over it, it says go to the next on red blip spacebar. This is, so this is another one of our attempts to try and make it clear to people that actually we've had all these really useful keyboard shortcuts all along. Um, so by actually putting other UI elements in there. So I'm not sure that we're actually going to have that button forever. We'll probably like evolve that interface a bit, but it's tricky with Wave because it's an entirely new interface and um, you do need different shortcuts for it. So getting people used to those shortcuts is, uh, you know, it, it takes some experimentation. So we're doing a lot of analytics and stats on our various attempts here and to try and figure out if it's helping or what other stuff we should be doing. Yeah. Right. No, I know. So I was using a, um, a Chrome extension for unread blip navigation, which is really cool. It actually will show you an arrow that points down to say how many unread blips are there, an arrow that points up that says how many unread blips are there. That's the ultimate. That's what we want to have in the client, right? And maybe integrate it into the, the scroll bar. Um, and I don't know what I would, I would do without that. So. Uh, possibly not due to the paging we did for scaling large waves. I think that, unfortunately, we are done. That's, I've been waiting, but feel free to come up afterwards. All right, thank you, everyone. <laughs>